this and I think I'll share my screen so that you can take a look at the diagram that on which I asked you to for which I asked you to find differences. Now the this seems like a fairly arbitrary exercise, um, perhaps no more or less arbitrary than pop quiz three, uh, asking you about the weight of a blue whale or the, uh, the temperature of the sun's corona. But each of them is designed to sort of illustrate a couple key principles of great importance to software engineering. Uh, pop quiz three is related to this issue of estimation. Particularly when you have something that's hard to estimate, the principle of, of um, giving ranges um, and ensuring that those ranges are wide enough, and the fact that we often do not have wide enough ranges. Um, we often overestimate our confidence, um, or we, 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 we uh, have too much confidence in the accuracy of our answers. Um, here for pump points four, the goal is actually um, a different one, and it's it, it's related to discovering issues of various uh, sorts or, or, or resources. Um, it's an issue that cuts across many areas of activity where you're trying to track down um, some features of a situation um, over time, and there's a set of them, and you're trying to discover them. So we have these two diagrams, um, which are from one of Tom DeMarco's books, uh, as I recall. Um, excuse me, it may not be Tom DeMarco. It's actually Jerry Weinberg's book on quality software engineering. He has a four volume series, um, which is very thought provoking. And I think this appears in there. And you have two images. And the goal, of course, is to find, they look at the face of it quite similar. Um, and the goal is to identify differences between the two. Um, and I was asked coming into the room, um, you know, how many differences are there? My recollection is there's somewhere around two dozen. Okay, so somewhere around 20 to 25. About 20. Um, now, obviously, we don't want to spend our the entirety of our time together you know, uh, discussing whether um, the, the location of the whale's blow hole on this is the same as that or something like that. But there are a couple uh, differences here. Um, anyone want to, to mention a few that you find? Yes, Jeremy. Uh, United versus untied. Yeah, United versus untied. Although there's good reason to wonder about which is more accurate these days. Um, uh, if you look, just look at the, the news, um, unfortunately, what's, what's another one? So that's a good one. And I'll be with you just as cyclers, but maybe just to rip on Jer Jeremy's point a little bit more. Um, the reason that that's hard to spot initially is often when we're looking for things, we look in a confirmatory way at a high level and we read things into the situation. And it's a bit like a splash screen where, you know, if Microsoft has spelled Mercosoft, you might not notice because you just see this kind of Microsoft and you don't even pay that much attention to the details of it. United and, and, uh, and Untied, if you glance at that in a moment and you see the states of America, it's very easy to assume, oh, you know, just falls into the expected pattern, right? Um, so uh, that comes up with software defects. Um, we, we kind of glance at the results of a test. We think, oh, it looks reasonable, but we're not really thinking through, is this indeed what I expect or does it just have that kind of flavor, but it's actually different in some subtle ways. Larissa, you were gonna say something. Long Island is your thing. <laughs> yeah, Long Island, which is a rather, rather um, market insult to the many hundreds of thousands, uh, if not actually millions of people once you commit a Brooklyn and Queens and so on that live there. So uh, Long Island, for those not familiar with uh, 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 New England is, is sort of sticking off, uh, it should be sticking off there, but it's somehow mysteriously vanished in the, the lower one. Um, good, good call, good call. How about another one? Yes, uh, the back. Josh. Josh, thank you. Yeah, the eagle has his has her 
her um, head flipped uh, flipped around, um, uh, looking left, looking right, um, and, and each of them. So uh, yeah, that's that's great. Other other things. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Jurgen. Has an extra line in the lower one yeah. compared to the upper one. <laughs> That's exactly right. Cool. Um, anyone else? Uh, Chef Snow. On the vents, location has a little bit uh, change in taking pictures. More closer towards the bottom. The what? The van. The van. Yeah. Okay, where? Oh, the van is down here uh, in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's 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 bumpers. It's in a fender bender here it's like it's it's bumping up against the end with its bumper uh very good yeah <laughs> yes yeah, so. oh. the tree and i'm gonna guess tennessee is different from it's like a triangle top and a sign is on the bottom yeah i think it's i think it's alabama um <laughs> this is georgia this is alabama um but uh yeah in any case somehow the tree got uh got distorted so um that's a good one. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. So in America. Like on this side or this side? Yeah. Fourth one, like this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, it's this, so he or she is missing the drumstick. Yeah, yeah, the drumstick is missing. Um, yeah, uh, good, good, good point. Um, uh, Larissa. Did anyone bring matches? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that's a very good point. So um, that's actually, so it's Vermont's missing. And so Vermont merged with New Hampshire. Wow, um, that'll be a wild political. <laughs> Confluence because Vermont is kind of um, leans leans more towards the, uh, the the progressive side. New Hampshire is live free or die, and um, if you merge them together, I don't I don't know maybe maybe they think they have to die or something. Um, so yeah, okay, good good call. Um, any anyone else? Uh, so uh, yeah, Zach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the flag is the opposite way in the border. Or again, yeah, the flag is flipped around. Yeah, <laughs> good, good call. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Mecca. Uh, this is fun. Uh, I don't you can't see it. Uh, uh, some, some are have eyes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. And I'm not sure how much of that is from the reproduction, but like. This B-52 bomber up in North Dakota also, it seems a bit displaced, but yeah, the eyes, the eyes have it. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I think eyes are present in one a little bit and not in the others. And I'm not sure how much of that is due to, to, uh, to problems with, uh, with reproduction. I think uh, the whales, the whale's eye looks a tiny bit different here, but I'm I'm not sure how much of that is different. Um, you know, again, if if it's if it's at all significant. But we've gotten a bunch of them. Now, how long did it take you to find these? So we've got a, a bunch, and I suspect there's high overlap. How long did it take you to find those? Like um, if I asked you how long it would take to find each one, what would you say to me? Okay, it varies. And were you finding them sooner at first or later? At first, okay. So you found a couple at first and then it took you longer. Uh, and why is that? It's a notable phenomenon. It occurs in all different spheres, including bug findings. You guys find the result. Why is that? Let me show you a graph from, from NASA. I had promised you this last time. So here's NASA um, software for three space probes. These are decent space probes that have traveled billions of miles. Um, I suspect the class next door size was either the untied space of America or the space probe. 
close the door from them. But you'll notice they, a couple big features of this. They found things early pretty quickly, but then it kind of took a while for them to find more. If you look at this, the x axis here, the horizontal axis, you'll see like one year is about yay long. Mm -hmm. um, and so they went maybe a year before the uh, Voyager probe without finding, it seems, any more defects in their probates. Um, this one, the Galileo probe, went also a large fraction of a year, probably, without, without finding defects. Kind of interesting, but they found them a lot quicker early on. And, and then it kind of, they all share this kind of curve called concave down. Um, yeah, yeah, so Larissa. There's a different way to like see the more obvious ones yeah. sooner. Exactly, exactly. So oil companies found the big oil deposits early. Then over time, they have to scrounge around more because, you know, they suck the big ones dry, right? And, and so then they look around more and they tried to find others, but those were smaller. The obvious ones were found early. It's, it's this way with, with cases of missing kids and so on. Like the, the obvious ones are cracked sooner. The ones that are harder, almost by definition, take longer to find. Um, so with defects, it takes a long time. So to give you a sense of this, right? I mean, we're talking like five years up here of time. And they're still finding defects, you know, with Galileo. This is five years after it began. This is not a single calendar year or time, calendar date. It's uh, when the project started. But the point is, five years later, they're still finding defects. And it's not predominantly because the software is still being heavily developed, and it's because they keep on, you know, finding defects in that software. Hopefully not after they're launched, although that probably sometimes goes on. Oh, so this is actually Watts Humphreys bugs or defects. Um, okay, so you know, principle here is it takes very different amounts of time to find. So that's why I was asking that kind of trick question: how long it takes you to find them? It can take longer later. What's another thing though you see about this diagram? There's Probably something else that's um, that's kind of obvious about this as well. Anyone? Well, defects are found in bursts, so so there'll be a a sort of steady rise and then a plateau and then a steady rise again, and plateau and when I say steady rise, I don't mean necessarily the rates of before, but there'll be a period where you're finding more and more and more, and then perhaps some stasis, and then you find a couple of them more, and then some stasis. So there's opportunities to learn from it. Like, and maybe you went through that a little bit with this root group fallacy idea um, where you're trying to track down defects because you say, oh man, I mean, there's something in these marching band things at the end, maybe I'll look there. Or you notice one of these curly, I don't know what to call them, but these things off to the side here, these kind of decorative components, maybe there's a problem in there. Or you start thinking about state lines, right? And you say like, well, I wonder if any other states are missing here. Um, or have their lines redrawn. Maybe at first you weren't thinking about it, but then you, you notice this thing with New Hampshire and Vermont and your curiosity is, is ticked. And so you start, you start wondering about it, right? Um, so, um, so it clues you into different types of errors. And so it is with, um, with finding defects. We find defects of certain sorts in rows, we, we, we discover, oh, I mean, there's defects like that here. Well, let's go see if we can find some more of them in your own role. And I would argue that's probably a lot of what was going on for some of these sprints, you know, after periods of stasis. They're on a roll because they find a certain pattern of defects, a certain type, or 
they put in place certain testing innovations that find those defects, or they have peer review processes that look for certain types of defects or whatever, and they're discovering them. Okay, so when it comes to, to defect discovery, learning is key. Um, you got to learn from what you found. And um, I've argued before that, you know, here and elsewhere in life, you know, two key questions you want to ask. In addition to debugging the program or the system, you want to be debugging your process of developing. Mark my words. We develop these things with certain processes, with certain practices that support those processes. Um, we go through a software development process and you're trying to debug your software development process and learn about that as well as learning where the defects are in your system. So you're gonna be asking, you know, how could similar mistakes be avoided in the future? And if they come about, how can we find them more quickly? Try to ask it that one. You know, it's, it's a positive thing. How can we do better you know, going forward? Um, and with defects, we can often generalize. You know, we find an off by one error or we find a buffer overflow error. We find an error associated with failure to check that a string is sanitized in terms of not having SQL. And, and so then we look for other things like that. And we try to, we try to pick up what we could be missing and look for it in peer review, in testing, and um, you know, when we're doing manual and automated testing, we put in place regression tests, etc. Um, now there's another form of learning that you folks should be thinking about, particularly as we come up to ID5, which is look, um uh, when you're when you're working with a system um, and you're trying to find defects, often you've accumulated a set of defects from earlier uh, in these, these stages here. You may remember we have these, this stock, this collection of undiagnosed bugs that are often there. We don't know. They're just out there in the system. We, 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 uh, we talked about ways of estimating this, but we we don't know about it yet. Yeah, they're undiscovered. And then they reach a bug report stage. But at this stage, they're kind of lower quality reports often. I'm, I mean, it, the, I shouldn't say they're low quality. They're they're mixed quality reports. Some of them may be uh, genuine new defects, some may be old, some may be earlier versions of the software, some are very incomplete, some are based on misunderstanding of how it's supposed to be used, some are duplicates, right? All of these are reasons that things at this stage before sanitization are often um, not, not to be taken at face value just in terms of count. We see 100 here. And in terms of serious new defects, it might be 30 because there might be so many duplicates or so many that are now outdated that the actual number may be a lot less than is normally reported, you know, normally in the in the uh, issue tracking system or so forth. Um, and sanitization can get at the active one stage. And this is process which is known as directed triage, which is a learning process. We think of triage as, you know, deciding who gets treated and who not, right? Um, um, what gets done when we have too few resources. And that's how we use triage in software. We're, we're in triage mode in the last stages of the deliverable to figure out which of these defects get fixed or not, for example. Directed triage is a process of wading through bug reports to prioritize them, to, to, to figure out which of them are, you know, to sanitize them and figure out which are worth fixing. And often it involves things at this stage or sometimes things at the next stage of active bugs, where we wade through them and we we decide, oh, this one's too risky to fix. 
Because if we try to fix it, we won't have time to really test it for or it's tricky to fix. We're not quite sure how to do it. It would be better to do a workaround. Tell Kira, you know, we're not going to be able to, to uh, do this with the button. We have to use it via the other thing, or whatever it is. Um, or it's going to be, uh, the, the feature is going to look like it's there, but it'll be left right by the workaround. So the active bug face, there's often directed triage going on there. And directed triage is undertaken often by the dev lead, the test lead, and or the project manager to figure out where we're at. It's it's basically collecting information about where the, you know, what's the quality situation. At the end of the day, how many really serious bugs do you have? Do you only remember? Do you remember the difference between severity and priority for a bug for a defect? What's the difference? Between severity and priority. Marissa? Severity is how bad things occur when it happens, but like how hard you need to fix them. So if you yeah. have something that was less bad than you were good, then you can fix it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you, you put it exactly right. So severity is if it occurs, how bad is it? Priority is, you know, um, what is what is the um, indeed the importance uh, and urgency of getting this thing fixed right right now? To what degree are we going to make it a priority to fix? And to what degree might we leave it? And there might be many reasons that we leave it. It's too risky. We don't have the luxury of fixing this because there are higher priority defects to fix. Ones that we can fix, that don't have a good workaround, that are really obvious to the stakeholder, or that are blocking other things, right? There can be defects that block other areas of functionality. We just have to fix them for that. Um, so, directed triage is about having this team, often it's a fairly specialized team, maybe it, it includes several testers, but who basically have gone through and, 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 and in the directive triage process, they figure out what sort of shape are we at? Because we can look at how many thousands of lines of code we produce. We can look at nominally how many features you know, we've contributed. But the thing that's less obvious is what's the quality situation? That's the thing you don't see. And often, that is the thing that short -trips. That is the thing that gets short trip. That is the thing that is, you know, the quality assurance processes are all too often left till the last minute, just before the deliverable. As the clock is coming down, you're trying to run tests and you run out of time. That's, that's the thing that's not seen that's often. Um, you know, just as important, but it's submerged. And therefore, you often don't know about it. And so directed triage involves waiting through that to figure out how bad is the situation, where are the priority bugs, where are the things we can let slip, you know, uh, what's an old, what's a new, and sorting through that. So directed triage is an information gathering process to support then triaging which get fixed and which do not, okay? Um, and it can reduce uncertainty and allow work to be impugned with greater confidence. You know, in the span of a day, by waiting through this, the end of the day, you could have a much better sense, you know, are we in pretty good shape quality-wise or is this thing so creepy that, you know, no new, no new development can be done now? Um, maybe you want to do this at the beginning of ID5 and figure out do you want to put your effort into those nice new features or do you want to put your effort into stabilizing it, refactoring it, getting it rock solid so Osgood can't crush it? Might be a good idea. Um, they call me the crusher. <laughs> 
Um, I have been known to go into a proper software, and, and I think it is a rather fun indoor sport for me. Um, okay, so um, some metrics to think about at this stage number of system trouble incidents. Yeah, this is system trouble incidents, don't worry. Um, and number of active ones, uh, um, and broken down by severity and priority that can come out of directed triage. Um, percent of tests that are that actually have have run, um, and percent of them that that uh, complete uh, properly. Um, that that might be something you know you could look at. Um, how long? Defects stay in the system before they close. If a defect's just circulating for weeks, that's not a great idea. You know, that's not a great situation. You can look at, you know, if it, if it by contrast closes within a few days, you open it, someone's on it, and they fix it within two or three days, you know, you're doing much better. Um, and companies that have been around for a while can look at things like fault feedback rates. Do you remember what that is? Talked about it up here. I wrote it that that far. Yeah, latency. It's yeah, like a chance of being created as well. Exactly. And you know, it's it's hard to observe directly, but if you give a long enough time, hopefully you find that new bug. Like it's something that's a bit hard because right, you go and you think I fixed the defect, but what you don't see immediately often is you can produce the norm. Um, and or several, maybe trickier ones, maybe ones that won't be noticed before the stakeholders get their hands on it, before the demo in front of the stakeholders on a Chromebook. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, these things, um, uh, if, if you give them time, they'll, they may manifest, right? Um, uh, so, um, Anyway, and, and number of defects opened or closed is another one. It bears noting. So I want you to look at this. So what we see here is um, a graph over time. Maybe this is days, um, where you have uh, a number of, of bugs that are that are fixed here, and number of bugs that are found newly. And so maybe, maybe these are weeks. And, you have a good testing team. And so they're finding like 100 bugs within this week, 100 STIs found. And uh, week two, they're finding like 120, something like that. That's pretty good testing. Um, uh, so, when is there the maximum number of, of bugs there? So, again, one of these is number of defects found per week, known defects found per week. Defects reported per week. The other is number of defects fixed per week. So the magenta is fixed. The the uh, blue is found. What is there the greatest number of defects uh, in the system? Yes, uh, that are known. Yeah, please. Okay, so here we have a big gap at the beginning between finding the rate at which we're finding. And the rate at which we're fixing, right? So here we like week one, we found 200 defects. We reported 200 defects, and we fixed 100. Right? That's a big gap. That's where this gap is biggest. But is that when there's the most defects in the system that are known? Think about it. So I enter after week one, and I know about a hundred more defects that are active than before, right? That are that, that are that are not fixed. Uh, week two, I know about another, I don't know, it's about a hundred as well that week. Um so I'm, the number that are known to me that are not yet fixed has gone up. They're accumulating. So, Bo, were you going to say something? Okay. Okay. Sorry, right. don't need to put you on the spot. Wait. Uh, yeah. Right in the equal. Yeah. Yeah. Because each successive week here, 
the number found per week is exceeding the number fixed per week. So it's just accumulating, it's accumulating, it's accumulating. It's like the water is coming into your bathtub quicker than it's going out. So it's just building up, building up, building up. And this is when the bathtub has equal water coming in and leaving around week nine-ish or something like that. And then you start draining the bathtub faster than it's coming in. So the numbers are going up here. So you have to be cautious about just rejoicing when you know the number of defects you're fixing exceeds the number you're finding. That's great, but it may take a while to, to draw down that bathtub. You know, draw down these defects you have. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay. So just be aware if we're dealing with what's fixed, what's found, which is which are common metrics. Defects open, defects closed might be a way to talk to talk about it. Um, you can have the number of defects closed in a given week exceed the number of pounds in that week, but you're still dealing with big backlog to work with. Got that point? Okay. okay. So in short, the number of defects in the system that are not yet fixed was building up here, built up slower as these two came together. It was just increasing less quickly here, and then it sort of plateaued, and then it started to go down here as we were fixing more than we were finding. Hmm? And it'll be going down for a while. We'll be catching up and fixing them over a period of time. Um, okay. Um, I think, I think that's all I'll comment on that, but just bear in mind that for this exercise, as for defects, giving a sense of what the velocity is in finding defects, it can be um, misleading if you're counting on your rate of discovery of defects in the next few days being as quick the number of defects you're finding per hour or per, per day of, bug, of testing as in the first day or two. Often you find the obvious ones and the ones that are not so obvious take long. Okay. Um, you saw it here with the missing drumstick, untied states, backwards flag. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go on to uh, a different uh, topic here. Um, so we're back and talking about estimation and um, got to watch my time because this was a topic we started last week on Thursday. And we started it with a quiz as well. And um, the quiz was meant like today's, what you today to impart some principles. Um, as noted earlier, it was meant to impart the principle that we're often overconfident about our ability to estimate things. What it didn't bring out though was this asymmetry that we talked about where there's, um, we're often hugely op over optimistic in, um, in estimating. We're really poor in terms of people in terms of estimating big chunks of work, particularly. We're over optimistic and we're too confident, as that quiz points. Um, and there's pressures on us early on to make a sale or to impress our boss or to look like we're showing leadership to underestimate how long things will take. Use the method of We tend to underestimate. We have pressure on us to underestimate because people are happy, stakeholders are happy, our boss is happy if we say we can do it sooner. But eventually the chickens come home to roost and we have to deliver in that time. That's often much harder. And we talked about some principles to be less likely to be burnt. We talked about how often software projects are held to account, whether they are viewed as a success or failure, as not just a reflection of 
the quality of the software, the features delivered, et cetera. It's not just, you know, is it, what's its performance? It's, did it get delivered, quote, on top? And the trick is to realize that on time is how on time is defined is often as a function of the original estimate. So if you say we can deliver it 10 weeks, it will be viewed as not being on time if you deliver it in 11 weeks or 12 weeks. If you had estimated for that same system 15 week delivery time, it would have been viewed as on time if you could deliver it in 12 weeks. So it's not just a function of the software. It's not just a function of the technical contribution of the quality of the code. It's, it's a function of your estimate. And so it behooves us to put a lot of care into estimates and to, to exercise some basic guidelines for, for giving these estimates. Um, so we talked about a couple of them. One of them was estimating in small pieces. This is one of the signal contributions of agile methods. Um, agile methods, well, agile methods derive some of their value because you're delivering in small pieces and you estimate in small pieces. You're not going to be off by months if you're estimating how much you can get done within a week's time. I have seen, <laughs> don't get me wrong, weird things have happened in the annals of software, believe me. Um, but, um, but you're less likely to end up being months off if you're estimating for a week's time. So estimating in small pieces is, is, um, is a principle. Another principle is don't estimate a chunk all at once. Break it down into its pieces in your thinking and estimate each of those pieces. If you estimate it all at once, you're often fooling yourself. It, it's really hard to sort of go from a gestalt understanding of it to say, oh, it's going to take this amount of time. It's much better to think through what are the steps that are needed? What are the different pieces? Oh yeah, we have to do the server side solution. We have to get some sort of message queue type system in place. We have to get the UI done. Um, we need a, a you know encryption support for it. Um, we need to somehow work with the camera API. And you start thinking through the various pieces. Uh, in ways that are quite fine-grained and give you a better, better sense of the amount of work, rather than just saying, oh, or, you know, I think it's it's such and such a, a so-called lag. Um, but there was another principle we talked about, which was using range estimates. So instead of just giving this inchoate estimate or this overall estimate as a single number to which you're then held, you give a range. Why do we give ranges? Anyone want to remind? Why ranges? Yes, Elizabeth. It reduces the chance that whoever is over. Exactly. You give one number, they're going to latch on. And then that's your criteria of success. You're over by a week, your project is late. You're over by a couple weeks, and maybe you the failure of a project, lack of leadership. But really, it's just a, but you are really uncertain when you get that number for a good reason. You are uncertain. And, you know, you gave a number that's too short. You did a great job on the system, just you gave a number that was too small. And you're also a problem. With a range, you're less, that's less likely to happen. Less for the people I want to say, you're a great for this. But there's another piece to it, too. What is that? Exactly. So if this is a project that's kind of a 
turn the crank very straightforward. You've done something very similar before. You know, you're converting, I don't know, a pump system from that's that's already in, you know, uh, Python 2 and you're converting it to Python 3 or something like that. Maybe it's very little uncertainty. Um, or you're converting it from, you know, this version of, of uh, React to that version of React. You're upgrading it a little bit. Um, you know, often you can tightly estimate that and you communicate that to the stakeholders. Um, whereas if you're really uncertain, you want to communicate that. And again, I argued last time on this floor and perhaps on this very seat that by so doing, you start a constructive dialogue of if you're really uncertain, the obvious question for them is how can I help you be more certain? What would it take for you to be able to estimate this one cycle? Right? Um, do you want a couple of weeks to do a spike prototype? Do you want uh, do you want me to you know take an expert from another team who knows Angular three inside out? Um, or you know uh, is really familiar with uh, like encryption and them to work with you to do the rest of the this? Do you want them on your team? Um, to, to, to lower that uncertainty. Um, if it's about how quickly your team can come up to speed on these technologies, it starts that constructive dialogue. Uh, so range estimates are, are very valuable. The problem with range estimates is what? What do we know from that pop quiz three that we took, which included such memorable questions that the numbers of Books published between 1776 and 2006. The length of the uh, of the, of the coastline of the Gateway continent. Something about the, the number of of uh, the amount of water in the Great Lakes. Um, uh, the weight of the heaviest blue whale and um, the uh, the year of Alexander the Great first. What do we know from them? Yes, Larissa. The, yeah, they go to the, they have a range, and a range is better than no range, but they're too narrow. I did hmm, look at some of your answers. I'm glad I heard the mask. Um, uh, not everyone is a student. Um, uh, but um, there were some, there were some pretty impressive answers in there too, I gotta say. And, you know, none of us should be a uh, thing. These aren't computer science questions, and you're not asked to be students of ancient history here. But um, we gave estimates that are too narrow when you're not. When you're, when you're uncertain, it behooves you to give wide estimates that show that. If you're not a student of ancient history, Give a nice range that's that's pretty darn wide, and that will let you uh, that will let you you know be confident that whatever the answer is, it's in there. But there's something about us psychologically that prevents us from doing that, that blocks us from saying, "Look, I I have no clue, you know, when Alexander the Great was born, but look, I know it was between like a thousand BC." And you know, um, 1970. You know, <laughs> like, like I think Elvis was born after him. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you could, you could uh, communicate this right um, in, in a big range, and we would have gotten more people up there and getting nine out of the ten within that range, or eight out of the ten. But instead, there's something psychologically that makes it feel like oh, and Alexander the Great couldn't have been born before whatever, and couldn't have been born after that. Even though we really, we know, we don't know, but there's something embarrassing about too wide a range. And so that's a that's a known issue. Um, so I talked about um, you know how dangerous uh, overestimation is and how how repeatable it is. <laughs> Like on this graph, there's not a single case of one that was 
that came in before its estimate. We, we are we are terribly uh, over optimistic in the values we give, and we're overly confident about the ranges we give. That's the problem. So range estimates are great. And look, even on their face value, giving a range estimate, not going through any more science answer about it, is a good thing. It'll help you. Um, but I'm going to show you something that will take it up uh, one more time. Okay? And it's basically about being savvy about how to use the money and to correct for our narrowness, to correct for the fact that we're too narrow. So range estimates are designed to make explicit optimistic assumptions and pessimistic And um, often we have an expected case. Okay? Um, and uh, that's, this is a, a, a good thing. Um, and I argued last time in my closing remarks on the on that part of the, the, the discussion of this, that you can have you know features and you can list the best case and a worst case and kind of a most likely case, and then sort of the expected one. This is a single most likely value, this is kind of the mean, and this is the best and the worst. And you can define these in different ways. The challenge that I identified there, and I didn't fix, was what? Does anyone remember? What did I say? This is great. You break it up this way, but what's the what's the question this is leaving out? Well, where this number comes from. Because what you don't want to do is just total up the best cases to get a best case for the whole. Total up the worst cases to get a worst case for the whole. Why not? Why, why don't you just want to sum these up, the best cases for the pieces, to get the best case for the whole? This is weeks to complete. Why don't you want to do this? Put aside the issue that some of these can be undertaken in parallel. It's incredibly unlikely you'll get a best case for all the more worst case for all. It's vanishingly unlikely. Um, so um, so this that's a, a key key issue. And this this is this involving sort of uh the discord pair. Now there's another one which is People interpret best and worst in different ways. We saw from the quiz. Believe me, I have a lot of sympathy for you folks. Being asked about blue whales and coming into a computer science class and being asked to estimate the number of books in the Library of Congress for a certain period, the amount of U.S. currency, and so forth. But um, but there's a danger here in you being too narrow in your estimates. So when you say best, worst for software, you may well be too narrow. You know, optimistic is maybe um, what you view as a little bit optimistic and pessimistic, a little bit pessimistic. Um, and so we have to have ways of correcting for that as well. Um, Okay, so sorry, question. Yes, yeah, sure. uh, as we have to choose like um uh, you make a uh, better estimation, yeah. Um that's not good for a project because they won't be able to get right on time. But if you're making a too broad yeah. estimation, then what about that? Yeah, so so it's a good question. And, and I actually had a I was wondering if we should go into that. There are times where people will react. I say react emotionally. I don't want to overplay. Um, people may react negatively to two broader, right? If you say, look, and they say, how long is this going to take? And you say, it'll take me between one week and 10 weeks. They're different between one week and 10 weeks, right? Um, 10 weeks is something to be done by the end of the year. I mean, it will be done maybe, you know, in late January or something like that, one week is 
it, it'll be done by next week. And then you can go on. Like, there's a big difference. People can react. I have seen it. I got a number of them. Um, but when that happens, my own my own style, and I think this is true for, for other leaders as well, is to use that, look, this is too big a range. Okay, now you use it to get the negotiation. Okay. Um, you'd like to narrow that range. Let's start talking about what we can do to narrow that range. Great. So you don't like that range, but I don't like that range either. Um, so one thing is you can give me more time to do the estimate, or you could let me talk with certain experts, or you could change my team composition. Or we could use different technologies. Maybe they're saying we need this thing in, you know, um, we need this thing to be able to, to run on GPUs. So I'd love to run on GPUs, but you know, that adds a lot of uncertainty. How do we defer that to the next version? And if we do that the next version, um, that would cut out a bunch of uncertainty. So you start that dialogue. If they don't like the range that's that gives you a certain leverage to say, okay, let's um, trade off some things with, with negotiation. Right? Negotiation is always about finding the win win. And that may seem to you lucky idea. It's actually not. There's something really deeply significant about the economy of money. And it's, it's because people have different preferences. The things I care about a lot, you don't care about so much. Things you care about a lot, I don't care about so much. We can trade off. You have lots of A, I have lots of B. Mm -hmm. um, so we can trade off. We can negotiate effectively. And that's how you use broad ranges. When people don't react well to broad ranges, you can it's, it's fine. Um, if they react negatively to it, you could say, well, look, we both don't want this really wide range. Let's figure out how to reduce it. There's another thing we don't want, which is we don't want a late stock. One where I give you whatever we want, and you know, we don't finish. We don't, we don't finish by it. Neither of us wants that. So let's work together to, to get down this range to a reasonable, reasonable level, right? Um, and often there are very concrete things. You don't have the right people on the team to estimate it likely. You're uncertain about that technology. You're worried about this certain feature. You're worried about this change they've asked for. Um, uh, you know, you're concerned about the fact that some of the team may be on call for another team. All these things are negotiable, right? And you should be able to negotiate. Or you say, look, I bet we could do this really quick. If we do it after this project, we're also juggling right now rather than, you know. So the point is, you, you get that space open for some discussion of possible. Um, that's that's kind of my, my view about it. Um, so one issue is, okay, you're, you're not clear enough on, on best and worst case. What do you mean by that? And it's good to be clear. What do you mean by your best case and worst case? And one definition, it's not privilege. It's uh, it's one is you know, Gus, you have like a third of a percent chance of being better than this of getting it or delivered earlier than this, and a, a third of a percent chance of being less less bad than this. Um, and you give that those two are the most likely case, and then it turns out we can derive the expected case. Okay. I'm not going to hold you detailed accountable for this, but I want you to know that the method is a good idea. So the idea is you estimate these ones that are in that are in bold, okay, and um, and you can derive the one, the expected case uh, from this. And let's talk about how we do this, okay? I'm not going to ask you to do this on the final exam, but I want you to know. Want you to know for the final exam that can be done. Notice I picked my words. I didn't say I want you to know it can be done for the final exam. No. I want you to know for the final exam that can be done. So the idea here is look, um, we're going to move beyond this assumption that we 
to get the best case, we just sum up the best cases. As Jeremy said, that's extremely unlikely, vanishingly unlikely. Will be the best for all and the worst for all. You know. Uh, so the idea here is that you're going to figure out the variance. Okay. Um, and I think most people here will have gotten exposed to the notion of variance in a in a statistics or probability class. Is it right? Two forty math two math or stats two. 241 or 245 or humble. Yeah. Um, okay. So the idea is look, um, if we could have uh, a best and worst case, we can use a, an estimate of the variance. And it turns out that when you sum up, if you assume each of these is independent, um you can actually sum up the variances the variance is the whole um and that's not going to be assuming all the best occur all the worst occur but some will be some will be sooner some will be later and so you have a variance here for each uh and we'll talk about where that comes from in a moment and then you have a, a standard deviation. The variance is the square root of standard deviation. Oh, sorry, the, square root, the standard deviation is square root of the variance. Variance is sigma squared. Uh, and this is variance, right? Uh, variance. And uh, the standard deviation is sigma. Standard deviation is the square root of all right, right? The Klein Hall or something. Um, okay. Um, so we're going to use this to to derive uh, a few things. So one is we're going to we're going to derive the expected case here. Okay, um, so specifying the best and the worst, the most likely, we're going to derive the expected case. And that's actually a formula we can use to, to derive what the mean is, the expected value. We covered expected values before that, right? Um, so if you have a set of probabilities of different outcomes and the outcomes I mean, this outcome, each outcome takes time x to y, and each one has a probability p to y of occurring, and you do a sum over i. Um, if the probabilities are all the same, this is just like an average of these. But um, this is overall possibilities. Uh, this would be like the expected value of x. And if it's checking at variables and intervals, it will sum but no one goes to that. Um, okay, so turns out that um, this would allow us to get the expected case. So the key is to compute the variance for, for this. And I want to compute the variance for the um, for for how how uncertain we are about each of these. We want to be able to compute this variance here for each of these estimates from the best to the worst case, come up with a variance. The variance is add, and we use this to derive the expected case. How are we going to get a variance for each of these? Well, the idea is look, if your best case is like three standard deviations out over there, I don't know if you remember this from that stats, but from your stats for 241, uh, 245, uh, you have a distribution like that. And we're trying to estimate here, maybe this is the single most likely case, this is the mode. Here it looks plausibly also like the, the mean. Um, we're trying to get a best case, like that's three 
least standard deviation out this way. In a worst case, that's three standard deviations out this way. So this is how bad it can be. You deliver it this, it takes this long to deliver. Seven weeks. And this is the best. This is three weeks or something like that. And this is five weeks. Um, so you're giving best and worst for each of these tasks for feature one. How long is it going to take? Best, worse, this is less time, which is more time. And, and if you know there are three standard deviations out, you can actually calculate how big the variance is because this is six standard deviations here. Three on this side, three on that side. So given a best, best case, given a worst case, subtract the two, divide by six. So this entire thing is six. Six. This is our best fix for this feature. This is our worst case. Yeah. Worst case. And we can simply take worst. Minus best divided by six for these six standard deviations, and we get sigma. We get this. Okay. That's the idea. And uh, if we do that, the problem is that we underestimate the width, and it turns out, and we'll have to uh, finish up here. But there's a way of correcting from our our tendency to underestimate the width. Okay. And the idea here is you look and you find from, from your past estimate, just like you're doing for me, for your deliverable, from your past estimate, what section of the time does your actual amount of time it took fall between your best and worst case estimate? Let's suppose only 30% of the time falls between your best and worst case. Then you know your they're actually not estimating several standard deviations out. They're estimating very narrow. It's not six standard deviations out. It may be one five. Um, and so, so here we can actually take a look and see uh, if the percentage of time your actual outcome falls within your best worst estimate range, which so close to thirty percent. Then basically. We can calculate the standard deviation using this uh, correction factor here. Worst case minus best case with the correction factor. If your best and worst are really six standard deviations out, so 99.7% of the time, the actual value of the length of time it takes falls within your best and worst range, then you divide it by six, just like I said. Okay, that's the idea. So you should know there is a way of doing this. This can allow you to derive the expected value of how long it would take and derive the variance and you add up the variance and you can get a amount of time that it will take best and worst case for the entire system. Okay, that's the basic idea. I'll post the slides, but we got to get up to the other room so that I can hear your presentation. Is uh, Kira coming today? Is that your? Oh, she wasn't able to make it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I will be posting this. Thank you very much.